And that is our prayer tonight, Lord, that every breath that we take in our entire life, Lord, would be to praise you. May you live through us, Lord. Let your light shine through us and let us be ready to go when you say go and stop when you say stop, to be available for all that you choose for us to do, Lord. May we live to praise you, Lord. And we thank you and we praise you tonight. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen. Well, good evening. So glad that uh, you came out on a Wednesday evening. I hope you enjoyed our food fellowship time. It's always a, a good time. You never know what's going to happen with this crowd. When we, when we get food, you know, it's funny. Good Christian behavior. Sometimes they bump each other, throw you down, wrestle. No, I'm just kidding. We don't do any of that. <clears throat> but we do have a wonderful time in the Lord. And that's what we're supposed to do. The Bible tells us, number one, not to forsake of the gathering together of the fellowship, but it also says gather together and break bread together. And so we love these times when we can do that. And uh, on Wednesdays, um, it's just been a blessed time that we bring that, uh, that the food is brought in and people can come and just enjoy and partake in fellowship. And then we have the worship in time for our, our Bible study and, and really be able to come together and, and listen and, and be attentive to God's Word. And I know that the, the weeks are tough. For those of us who work, for those who have, or even for those who are retired. Matter of fact, I've, I know this for a fact. The retirees work harder than the ones who have jobs. It's, it's, it's the way it works. I've seen it happen over and over and over again. And so uh, I know that sometimes when you get to that middle of the week, you know, your body you know, is weak. The mind and your heart and your spirit's willing, but the, the flesh is weak. And so we come, though. We come because we're hungry for more of God. We're hungry for more of, of who He is. And so we've been, um, we've been coming together on our second and fourth Wednesday. And um, I'm so glad that we're able to continue to do this as we, as we move forward in, in what God has for us to do here at Calvary Chapel River Oaks. If you have your Bibles, if you'll open up to uh, 1 Samuel... We're going to be uh, in chapter 18 this week. And if you're uh, visiting with us, I encourage you to go and listen to all of our studies. First Samuel's been a wonderful study as we continue to dive in and, and just see what God has for us. It's amazing how no matter where we are in the Word, the application is where we are today in our lives. Because God's Word is living, it's active, it's a two-edged sword, mightier, than anything else that we can imagine. And so when we come in and we get into His Word, it really doesn't matter where we are if our hearts are attuned to His Spirit. Because He's going to teach us and He's going to grow us and He's going to cause us to know Him more and more. So as we finished up chapter 17 in our last study, we covered the epic story of David and Goliath. The big battle between the oddities, the giant and the young boy. David just being a young boy before... Uh, before everybody, and he's coming to the army, and he says, hey, I'll go out and fight this giant. And everybody's looking at him, you're just a boy. You know, you don't have anything to bring to the table. Look, Saul even told him, he said, Goliath is a, is a giant. He's a man of war from his youth, and you are but a youth with no experience. And then David told him about his story with the lion and the bear, and he told him how God delivered them into his hand, and he would deliver Goliath as well. And so Saul told him, okay, if you want to do this, go out. But he wanted to send him out with his, his armor and his battle. I mean, battle armor. Remember, Saul was a man of war as well. He had his, all of his armor, he had his sword, and he had all these things. Well, David didn't have any of those things. And so Saul said, here, let me dress you with my armor. So he puts all this armor on, and you can just picture this, this little person with armor just hanging all over him, and he couldn't walk. He even said he couldn't walk in it. And he said, you know, I'm not, I, haven't tr I haven't tested these things. I'm not comfortable wearing your armor. So he didn't take any of that. He couldn't wear it. It didn't fit. He wasn't used to it. And also, we believe and we know that God have a, had a bigger plan. You see, in this story, along with all of the stories in the Bible, they're not done with conventional wisdom. The battles aren't won with traditional battle uh, uh, cries or, or armor or weapons or any of those things. We see God moving in powerful ways. I mean, just think of the Battle of Jericho when they marched around and the walls fell down. Completely different than anything else that people had seen. God was in control. 
And God was not going to allow anything else to take away the glory from himself when he won this battle for David. So from the pairing up of David and Goliath to the weapons used, it's obvious that if God wasn't present, this battle would not have taken place the way it did and the outcome would not have been, been good. But David knew that this was God's battle, not his own. He knew that when he went out to face Goliath, that he was going out in the name of the Lord. And this battle was over before it began. Not in the way that everybody thought it was going to be, though. I mean, all of Israel, all the Philistines, Goliath himself, everybody except David, <laughs> just said, David's done with. He's toast. It's over. But the battle was won because David went out in the power of the Lord. David took a sling and five stones and had more confidence with God than Saul and his whole army had put together. They were all cowering before Goliath. Not a one would step up. But David went out in the name of the Lord. And David said in verses 45 and 46 to Goliath, he said, You may come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. Well, as we read, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> he went out. He killed him with one stone. And that was funny. We talked about this in the last study. Even with David's confidence in the Lord, he went out overprepared. He still had his shepherd's staff, and he also took out five stones. And he only needed one. But the truth is, is that he did what God told him to do. He went out and gathered the stones, and he was prepared. And then he didn't even have a sword. So he had to take Goliath's own sword and uh, detach his head from his body. And we left last time together seeing David going from there to Jerusalem, back to the army, carrying Goliath's head. <laughs> he didn't want to put it down. I think in his own heart and mind. You know, it's funny. And I, 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 I believe this is this way for some of us. We have the confidence because the Spirit of the Lord comes upon us and comes into us and tells us to go. And so we go in that confidence. And when we're, the battle's over and we want it, there's that... And then there's that aspect of almost disbelief. It's like, did that just really happen? Did God just move in that way? We've been praying, we've been seeking, and now, and here's David after that battle, he said, I, I got evidence that really happened. And he ain't going to put that head down. A big old head, had to be a big old head, because Goliath was a big old boy. So this week we begin 1 Samuel chapter 18. Father, we ask that you will open our ears and that we would be prepared for what you have for us today and that your word would come alive to us and, and let, it, let it be in our hearts and minds so that we recall it, Lord, when we are challenged, when we are in discussion, when we are in the world and, and we need this word, Lord, to come to our minds and to our hearts. I pray, Lord, that you would bring it to a quick recall and that it would be exactly where it needs to be when we need it. And we thank you for your word. and We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 18, beginning with verse 1. Now when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul, and Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even to his sword and his bow and his belt." Now we've touched briefly on this relationship between Jonathan and David before. We remember that Jonathan also had the call upon him when the, when the Lord spoke to him and said, go up and take your armor bearer and go up the hill and attack the Philistines. And the Lord told him, you know, if, he, if they call us up, that means that we have this battle. And so he, the, the battle had been going on for a long time. Nothing was happening. The Israelites were paralyzed with fear in that case too. And Jonathan then goes up, he and his armor bearer, and goes up in the name of the Lord, kills 20 men, and the whole battle took off from that point on, and Israel won the battle. Again, an instance that you see the soul of Jonathan, his heart for the Lord was very similar to David's. They had very much, a, a whole lot in common. They were much alike. They were adventurous. They were brave. And they loved the Lord and were obedient to his leading. 
And personally, I believe what they have, what we often hear called a kindred spirit. And that's where the, the Holy Spirit has touched the heart of more than one individual in a similar way, and they just connect, automatically connect when they meet. They just know that God has brought them together for a purpose, and the relationship is a deep relationship. It's a soulful relationship. And in verse 1 it says, The soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Now I wanted to mention something here. that If you've not heard this before, it may seem odd to you, but it's out there. And I want to touch on this aspect of what's going on in the world and what they, how some have taken this, this passage and have twisted it to mean something that it doesn't mean. There are some in the gay community that have grossly misused this community saying that Jonathan and David had an intimate relationship as a, as a man and a woman have because of the way that this is written and the way it, it presents it. He had a relationship deeper than his own soul with David. Nothing can be further from the truth. And you may ask, well, why are you preaching to the choir? We all understand that, and I do know that you know this is true. But I also know that I have personally heard this in conversations in the world where they are defending some of the actions in this group using Scripture to do it. And they're grossly misinformed. They don't understand the Word of God. And so I wanted to take a moment here tonight to just touch on this point so that you would be prepared if you face this argument from the world that you would be able to say, no, you got it wrong, and here's why. Because God is a perfect God who doesn't say one thing and do another. He's consistent in all of His ways. His truth is truth. It's not truth today and be relative tomorrow depending on how God feels. God doesn't have feelings the way we have feelings. God is God. And His laws are perfect. His rules are perfect. Everything that He speaks is perfect. And He changes not. And we understand that as believers. So He's not going to say something here and then come here and allow something else to take place that goes against His Word. Leviticus 18.22 says... You shall not lie with the male as with the woman, speaking to men. It is an abomination. It's an abomination. This is how God views this sin. And now, there were many sexual sins, and you can go and look up in, the, in Leviticus chapter 18. They're all listed within the law, the Levitical law, regarding sexual sin, all of which are forbidden by God. And Leviticus 18, 29 through 30 says, For whoever commits any of these abominations... The person who commit them shall be cut off from among their people. Therefore, you shall keep my ordinance so that you do not commit any of these abominable, abominable customs which are committed before you and that you do not defile yourselves by them. I am the Lord your God. God's truth is spoken. This is how he sees this sin. And his word is true. And if his word tells us that homosexuality is an abomination... He would not then turn around and anoint one that is practicing this act as king of Israel. It couldn't be done because that then takes God and makes him telling non-truths. And God always speaks truth. David was chosen to replace Saul. He was anointed as the new king. 1 Samuel 13, 14. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. These are the words that Samuel spoke to Saul when Saul was being disobedient and would not follow the word of the Lord. And if David is a man after God's own heart, he would not practice these abominable acts before the Lord. Now, not to belabor this point, every person has a choice to be obedient to God's Word or not. And there may be some who are drawn to this lifestyle for various reasons. Mostly from the experience that I've had in, in counseling and hearing of other counselors and talking to people who have, have struggled with this sin, you'll find that majority of them have been very, very severely wounded somewhere in their past. Their families were dis... I don't even know what word I want to use there. They were just dysfunctional. That's the word I want to look for. Their families were dysfunctional in so many ways. And so the parents were not 
operating in a godly manner a lot of times in their homes or other people in the family. It may be, it may be even relatives or friends somewhere else along the line, but they're wounded somewhere in this area and they've come to believe a lie about themselves. And as they believe this lie, they begin to say, well, I was born this way. God created me this way. And this is a stronghold of sin. And this stronghold is very intense. It's very intense. And it's of spiritual nature. And the enemy binds people up. And it's not just this stronghold. We find strongholds in every area of our lives in the flesh when the enemy tries to keep us all bottled up and wrapped up in an area that, he, that, that, that God wants to set us free in. But if we're believing a lie, God can't set you free from that lie until the lie is exposed. But no one can say that they're born to be this way or that way. Sin is sin. And a choice is a choice. And anything else makes God's word untrue. And without God's word, we might as well close the doors and all go home. There's no point because at that point, you're just playing church. You're just coming to get together. And while we do enjoy our fellowship time together, I believe that's a very important part of our walk with the Lord and, and relationship one to another. But if that's all that there is, there are many social clubs we can go and dance clubs and anything else we'd want to do to participate to get that social aspect of who we are. But God's Word is our foundation. It's our standard. It's our absolute authority that we live by. And no matter how much pressure and ultimate persecution, because that's what's happening in the world today, this particular area is raising its head and it's coming against the church in a powerful way. And we may suffer persecution because of our stance on this issue. But no matter how much of that pressure and how much persecution we face from the world, we cannot waver on God's word. We have to maintain God's Word as our standard, as our truth. Because without that, we're nothing. We, we, we can't be God's people if we don't believe God's Word. So, I just wanted to, to take that aspect of this, mainly because I have heard this personally, and I don't know if you've heard this before, but I have heard it, and I just really want to make sure that we understand how to defend it. Without anger, without without hatred. There's no hatred in God's Word. This is love. This is love setting someone free from the bondage of sin and death to share truth out of God's Word. There's no hate there. And anyone who say that we're hating because we don't agree with the lifestyle, what they're really saying, they, they don't even understand what love is. Because I would rather them hate me for telling them truth than them to die in their sin because I didn't say a word because I love them. I accepted them. I didn't want to offend them. That's not who we're called to be. God's word will be an offense. And some will stumble over it. But some will receive it. And for those who receive, they will be changed and their hearts will be set free. And that's for any of us in any bondage, in any sin. Because God looks at all sin the same. It's ugly. And He wants us to be free from and he wants us to let that light shine to be to help others be free as well verses 5 through 8 so David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely and Saul set him over the men of war and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants now it happened as they were coming home when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistine that the women had come out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his, ten thou or his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Then Saul was very angry, and the saying displeased him. And he said, they've ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they only ascribed a thousands. Now, what more can he have but the kingdom? So we see David now placed in an authority over the men of war. And we read that he behaved wisely in all that Saul had sent him to do. See, God's anointing was on David. And everything David did, 
God blessed. When Saul would send him out, he blessed whatever venture he went out to do. And then he would return. And it was praise for him. And the people loved him. And everything's going great. The Philistines are on the run. They haven't regrouped since Goliath. Every venture is prosperous. Everything is wonderful. Israel has regained its confidence. Saul is even feeling pretty good about the way things are going. And then all of a sudden, it all comes crashing down. But it wasn't a battle this time. It wasn't an enemy lined up that they were afraid of. It wasn't a huge mountain that they didn't know how they were going to get across. It all comes down because of pride. And we've seen over and over from Saul's life and as, his, as he became king, that pride has been his downfall. If he was able to come to Samuel after disobeying God's word, doing part of it, but not completing the word of God he told him to do, and said, oh, look, look what I've done. I've done all that God had called me to do. And see, God had called in that particular battle to kill everyone, men, women, and children, all the animals, everything, and the king, and not take any of the spoil. But what did he do? He killed everybody except the king. He kept the best of the animals because he wanted to offer them as a sacrifice in his own mind. And then they took some of the spoil. And he's telling Samuel, look, I've done all that God called me to do. Look how blessed we are. And Samuel says, well, what's that bleeding of sheep I hear in the background? And the, and the mooing of the cows. What, what is that? You didn't obey the voice of the Lord. You can't partly do it. You can't just say, I'm going to do, well, okay, Lord, you've laid out five things here. Okay, yeah, I like that one. Oh, yeah, def oh, abs Lord, I'm going to give you glory on that one. I'm going to skip three and four, though, and we'll come back and we'll do five. That's not how God works. When God says go, you go. When he says stop, you stop. When he says do, you do. You don't pick and choose out of that. And see, that attitude is exactly what's going on in the world today regarding the church. The church is picking and choosing. Instead of saying God's word is all true and we're going to be obedient, they decide, ah, we don't like that one, that's going to offend, and we don't like that one because these people are going to be mad at us and the church will all walk out if I preach on that. We'll just pick what we want. But we're so obedient, God. Thank you, Lord. We're so glad that we're obedient to your name. That's not pleasing to the Lord. It wasn't pleasing here. And so Saul's anointing was taken from him. And it was given to David. And all because of pride now. David and the army and, and Saul, they all come riding into town. Everyone's excited. The women are singing. They're but now David's fame has gained momentum. And they love David. And they sing, while Saul has killed his thousands, David has killed his ten thousands. Psalm 73, 6 says, Therefore pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. And Proverbs 13, 10 says, By pride comes nothing but strife, but with the well-advised is wisdom. And Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Saul's pride was already getting him angry. And he became angry, he became violent. And of course, he also had that distressing spirit that the Lord had sent to him and tormented him. And it's ironic that in Saul's anger, he says in verse 8, now what more can he have but the kingdom? Saul doesn't know that David has already been appointed and anointed by God to replace him as king. See, that was done hush-hush. Saul didn't know that Samuel went and did that. He did know that his anointing was, was removed, and he also knew that ultimately he would be removed from, from his kingship. But he doesn't know that it's the very one that he's raised up and placed in his army ranks over, over his army uh, uh, of people. And it's how he's sending him out and things are happening with David. He does see that something good is happening with David, but he hadn't quite yet put all the pieces together. It's the very one that he's raised up is the one that's going to replace him. And he doesn't even see it coming. But from this point on, he doesn't trust David. 
because now he's starting to see things aren't looking good here. They're liking him more than they like me. And when you have a man full of pride who's already been told he's going to lose his kingdom, it wouldn't matter who it was that he thought in his mind was going, to be, was going to be a threat to him. He was going to try to take him out. And that's what was going on from that point forward. Verses 9 through 16 says, So Saul eyed David from that day forward. And it happened on the next day that the distressing spirit from God came upon Saul. And he prophesied inside the house. So David played music with his hand as at other times. And remember, David was called earlier because he played the harp. It brought comfort to Saul when he had this distressing spirit was upon him. So David was, as at other times, there, and he was playing the harp. But there was a spear in Saul's hand. And verse 11 says, And Saul cast the spear, for he said, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped his presence twice. Now Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. Therefore Saul removed him from his presence and made him his captain over a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. And David behaved wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Therefore when Saul saw that he behaved very wisely, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. So what we're seeing with David is just what you see is what you get kind of a guy. He, was, he put on no airs. He wasn't pompous and arrogant. So when he would come in, he would, he would greet people, and he would go out, he would greet the people. He pretty much considered himself as one of them. He didn't consider himself to be elevated in any way, even though he knew that he was anointed because Samuel came to his home and did so. But he never took that in a prideful way, and he never used that against people. He always came and went, and the people loved him. They saw David, and they welcomed him. And it's one thing, just as a real quick point, that as leaders in the church, we have to also understand that same mentality, that we're just one of the people. We come and we go with you. And it's not about elevated. It's not about, this is the pastor. Oh, I hope you never feel that way. I want us to be brothers and sisters in the Lord and that we grow together and that I want to go and come among you. And I, and I think that all pastors should take that mentality. A pastor should never be elevated above who he is, a servant. And any leader in the church, as well as all believers, that's what we are. We're servants. We're called to serve. We're not called for our own interests. We're not called to be anything special. And David did not see himself as anything special. He just went and did whatever came before him to do. And one of the main things that we can glean from these verses that we're reading this afternoon is God's Word always comes to pass. We've seen that over and over. We've discussed it over and over. But there's nothing that man can do to thwart God's plans. Nothing man can do to thwart it. Deuteronomy 32, 39 says, Now see that I, even I am He, and there is no God besides me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal, nor is there anyone who can deliver anyone, I'm sorry, is there any who can deliver from my hand? Isaiah 43, 12 through 14, I have declared and saved, I have proclaimed, and there was no foreign God among you. Therefore you are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. Indeed, before the day was, I am He, and there is no one who can deliver out of my hand. I work, and who will reverse it? No one can stand against it. That's Isaiah 43, I believe. Did I say 40? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. 43, 12 through 14. And as we'll see here that Saul, everything he tries doesn't work. It doesn't work. He's tried to pin David to the wall. He misses. He's a warrior. He don't miss with a sword or a spear. But he misses. David escapes. And as we see, that nothing that he does from this time forward will change the spoken word of the Lord. We will also see that, that God does things in his own time. And this is another important aspect of a relationship with the Lord. God does things in his own time. 
And if he speaks something forth and it's going to happen, it will happen according to his timetable and his plan. And sometimes things take a while for various reasons. David had a lot of growing up to do. He was anointed as king as a boy. But it was some 14 years later before he became king. And there was a lot of trials. There were difficult days, many difficult days. And I have no doubt at all that most of the psalms that he wrote came from the remembrance of those difficult days. David was high and he was low. He experienced the real feelings of being under the hand of tribulation, under the hand of pressure and persecution. But he also experienced the knowing and the, and, the, and the wonderful experience of God's hand upon his life in the middle of it. And we see that expressed in the Psalms that he wrote. The highs and the lows all come from the experiences that he went through. And some from childhood on. And it's the same for us today. That the experiences that we go through, there's not one here today that, that if you're a believer and you've been a believer for any length of time, there's nobody in here that, that can say that you can't pull something that you just didn't see how in the world you're going to get through it, and God delivered you. And you have that as your testimony. You have that as your strength. You have that as your hope. And that's what David was writing about in a lot of his writings. And I want this to be an encouragement to you today. Through the dark and the difficult times, these will serve as our testimony to the others that we come in contact with, proclaiming the glorious way of how God has moved and how God has delivered and how God has set us free. Now, as I've said many, many times, I want to interject here also that we don't take that testimony and force it on people and say he's got to do the same thing with you the same way and if it doesn't, you, then you're not really, he didn't really do it. And I've seen that happen in the church where they, they, it's what I call experiology where they take their experiences and make it theology and they put it on people and say, oh, no, 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 God can't do it that way. He's got to do it this way. And that's not, that's not right. God is a big God. He doesn't need us to tell him how to do anything. And he also knows where everybody else is in ways that we don't know. So while he used this way to deliver us, he may use something completely different to minister and deliver someone else because they are experiencing something totally different from their mindset than we could even imagine. But he's the same God. He's the same deliverer. He has the same power, the same strength. And all it takes from us is, here I am, Lord. I trust you. I put my hope in you because I can't see any other hope and there is no other hope except you, Lord. And that's what we're called to do. That's what we're called to do. And he will bring us through. Psalm 35 says, For his anger is but a moment, but his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night but joy comes in the morning. Oh, don't we love for the morning? Unless you're not a morning person, then you have to get up and it's still dark. And I've been running more in the mornings lately, and it's hard. It's hard. I do it because it's so hot in the evenings, because that's even harder. So, I mean, it's like pick or choose, you know, but I get up. But I will say this, when I when I'm finally get up out of the bed, that's the hard part. And I get dressed, and I go out, and I get to the park, didn't quite come up yet. It's just about to break over the sun, over the, over the, over the uh, east, eastern sky, and it's coming up over the trees. And I see that horizon, and I'm just blessed by that. I just see, oh, wow, God, you are, you, your works are continually, day and night. The sun always comes up in the east. I've never seen it come up in the west. I've never seen anything change outside of the, of the hand of how you created it to be. And it's a wonderful thing to, to, to be a part of that and to see that and to experience that. And that, again, is one of those things. It's that joy in the morning. Because when I go to bed at 9, I say, Oh, man, I don't want to set the clock for 6.30. I don't want to get up. And that's pain in the night right there. I don't care who you are. But anyway. <laughs> verses 17 through 25. Then Saul said to David, Here's my older daughter, Merib. I will give her to you as a wife. Only be valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul thought, let my hand not be against him, but let the hand of the Philistines be against him. So David said to Saul, Who am I and what is my life or my father's family in Israel that I should be son-in-law to the king? 
See, this again tells us a little bit about David's attitude. He did not feel worthy to be the son-in-law of the king. He never elevated himself. But it happened at the time when Merab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, that she was given to Adriel, the Mahalathite, as a wife. Now Michael, or Mashal, I've heard it pronounced different ways, Saul's daughter loved David, and they told Saul, and this thing pleased him. So Saul said, I will give her to him, that she may be a snare to him, and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Therefore Saul said to David a second time, You shall be my son-in-law today. And verse 22 continues, And Saul commanded his servants, Communicate with David secretly, and say, Look, the king is delight in you, and all his servants love you. Now therefore become the king's son-in-law. So Saul's servants spoke those words in the hearing of David, and David said, Does it seem to you a light thing to be a king's son-in-law, seeing I'm a poor and lightly esteemed man? And the servants of Saul told him, saying, In this manner David spoke. Then Saul said, Thus you shall say to David, The king does not desire any dowry, but one hundred foreskins of the Philistines to take vengeance on the king's enemies. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. Now we remember back in chapter 17, it was told that whoever killed the giant would marry one of the daughters of Saul, become the king's son-in-law. And Saul promised David mayor of his oldest daughter, but he didn't follow through on that promise. And as the time came, he gave her away to another. But being the conniving man and prideful man and fearful man that he was, when he found that his daughter Michael loved David, he thought he could use this to, be to his advantage and to use her against David. What a way to enter into a family dynamic. You know, yeah, I'm going to give you my daughter, but she's going to mess you up. I'm going to see to it. You know, she's going to trip you up. She's going to be um, something that's going to be in my favor, not in yours. And our text says in verse 21, I will give her him that she may be a snare to him and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. And basically, he uses his daughter as bait to get David to go out once again in battle with the Philistines in hopes that he would be killed. Knowing that David feels unworthy to be the king's son-in-law, he puts before him a task that will earn his right to marry Michael. Go and kill the hundred Philistines and bring back their foreskins as a dowry. Verses 26 through 30 says, So when his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to become the king's son-in-law. Now the days had not expired. Therefore David rose and went, and he and his men, and killed two hundred men of the Philistines. And David brought their foreskins and gave them in full count to the king, that he might become the king's son-in-law. Then Saul gave him Michael his daughter as a wife. Thus Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David, and that Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him, and Saul was still more afraid of David. So Saul became David's enemy continually. Then the princes of the Philistines went out to war. And so it was, whenever they went out, that David behaved more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so that his name became highly esteemed. As we said earlier, no matter what Saul tried to do, his plans always fell short. And David not only went out to do what the king required, but he doubled the requirement. And he brought back 200 of the foreskins of the Philistines. He doubled what he was required to do. God's hand of blessing was upon David in everything that he did. And Saul continued down the trail of pride and anger, and his heart grew darker and darker. And our text says in verse 29 that he became David's enemy continually, but all in no avail. All to no avail. Because his time was running out. Saul had made his decisions earlier on. He allowed pride to come in. He allowed the, fl the flesh to reign in his life. And so from this point on, he was going to scramble. He was going to strive. He was going to do anything he could to hang on and cling to whatever he could, as long as he could. And to become David's enemy continually really put David in a bad spot, which we will begin to see as we get into the study, uh, into the, our next time together, as to things that would begin to happen to David but all to no avail because God had a plan for David's life. And if God has a plan for your life, 
no matter what you see coming at you, no matter what you feel the enemy's doing, God is going to see that plan through. And of that you can be sure. He never, ever wavers on his plans. So don't give up hope. And don't find yourself in a place of, of doubt and despair because you haven't seen something happen that you felt like God told you was going to happen. If God said it, he will do it. Just hang on. And it's like that song. I think it's um, Casting Crowns does. There's a line in one of their songs. It says, your world's not falling apart, it's falling into place. And that's something very important for us as believers to understand. See, the world will see us, and we can view ourselves the same way, that we're just a mess, we're falling apart. God's given up on us. He's not doing what he said he was going to do. We're, what's happening? But really, what's falling apart is what's on you that he doesn't want on you. The flesh. He's pulling that off. He's causing that to fall off. And as that falls off, sometimes we feel our world's falling apart because we don't want to let it go. We want to hang on just a little longer. That was my comfort zone. I liked that because I felt secure there. And God says, that's not security. I'm your security. Let it go. And then things fall into place because our relationship begins to align with what God wants for us and his desire for our lives. But as Saul is concerned, it's like Job wrote in Job, in, in, uh, Job 5.12, it says, he frustrates the devices of the crafty so that their hands cannot carry out their plans. He frustrates the devices of the crafty that their hands cannot carry out their plans. And how frustrating and how sad for Saul. He's on the road to self-destruction, and it's all because of this pride that he's allowed to swell up in his heart. And let me close tonight saying that there's, if there's any area of your life, and this is one of those moments, again, that, that we need to always come back and do that self-examination. It's easy to look at Saul. It's easy to look at those in the Word. It's easy to look in testimonies and see how other people have dropped the ball and how they've messed up. But what God always calls us to do is to examine our own hearts. And so as we come to our own hearts... If there's anything there that God has been revealing to you where pride has taken its place on the throne of your heart, I encourage you tonight to submit that to Him. To release that to Him. Repent and deal with it. God loves us enough to allow His grace to continue to give us these chances of repentance. But at what point will that stop? At what point is that line drawn? I don't know. That's between God and his people. But what I do know is that at some point with Saul, he crossed the line and he couldn't go back. It was too deep. The pride was too rooted. I want you to close your eyes and I want you to meditate and, and pray with me, if you will, some of the prayers that David prayed. Just a couple here, Psalms 139 and in Psalm 51. We're not doing all of the chapters, just a couple of verses here. But let's all, uh, just, I want you to close your eyes and I want you to meditate on these words and, and to seek the Lord and however you connect with Him on this. But Psalm 139, 23 through 24 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. In Psalm 51, 10 through 11, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Father, as we close tonight with these words from the psalm, I pray, Lord, that these will be heart spoken words from our heart to you. That, Lord, that we actually take these prayers and apply them into our lives and to ask you, Lord, to search us, examine us, know our hearts. Lord, because you already know our hearts, we can't hide from you. Where can we go from your presence? Where can we flee? Wherever we lay our bed, you are there. Whatever we do, you are with us there. We can't hide from you. So we ask you, Lord, 
to try us and know our anxieties, our anxiousness, all the things that we struggle with in the flesh. And Lord, see if there's any wicked way in there and cleanse us from that wickedness. We repent, we choose to repent, even now, Lord, to lay that at your feet, that we may walk in wisdom and in the power of your Holy Spirit. 